It was an ordinary day for most Americans until 2.25 p.m. when a quiet but lethal disruption spread across the nation's telephone network. At AT&T's Network Operations Center in Bedminster, New Jersey, engineers first noticed an anomaly. A flood of red warning signals illuminated their massive 72-screen video wall, a sophisticated display of the company's sprawling long-distance telephone network. Over the next nine hours, engineers would scramble as 50 million calls were lost and the nation was left without communications. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, we're taking a detailed look at the software bug that brought the entire AT&T long distance network to its knees. For AT&T, the stakes were pretty high. The company handled 70% of the country's long distance traffic at the time, and its network was considered a model of reliability. On any given day, the system processed more than 115 million calls with remarkable efficiency. The backbone of this operation was a sophisticated network of 114 massive electronic switches, each capable of handling hundreds of thousands of calls per hour. These switches communicated through a system known as Common Channel Signaling System 7, or SS7, an intricate system designed to ensure that every call found the quickest, most efficient route to its destination. But on that fateful Monday, the system was about to break down in ways that nobody could have predicted. At the heart of the problem was a switch in New York City. It performed a routine self-test and detected that it was nearing its load limit. As designed, the switch then initiated a four-second reset to relieve the call pressure and sent a message to the network, informing other switches to stop routing calls its way until it was back online. Now, the reset worked as expected, but what came next was a cascading failure that would spread like wildfire across AT&T's meticulously designed system. In the world of telecommunications, milliseconds matter. After the New York switch came back online, it sent out a series of signals indicating that it was ready to process calls again but a fatal bug in the system's software introduced chaos. The New York switch sent a second message just milliseconds after the first, confusing another switch elsewhere in the network. The receiving switch couldn't handle the rapid succession of signals, and instead of properly queuing them, the software began overwriting critical communications data. This caused the switch to initiate its own reset, sending signals back to other switches, triggering a domino effect across the entire system. Within minutes, the entire long-distance network ground to a halt. People before the internet could not reach other cities by any means. Calls were dropped, signals were lost, and confusion reigned in the network operations center. Engineers were dealing with a disaster unlike anything they had seen before, one that would take eventually nine hours to contain and would result in the loss of some 50 million phone calls, costing AT&T an estimated $60 million in unconnected calls. This catastrophic failure was no ordinary outage. It was a perfect storm of timing, software flaws, and a system that was, in theory, designed to prevent exactly this kind of meltdown. Yet for all of its technological prowess, AT&T's network had been crippled by a single line of faulty code. So what exactly had gone wrong, and how could such a small flaw ripple through one of the most advanced communications networks in the world? Well, the answer would slowly be uncovered in the hours that followed as frantic engineers worked tirelessly to stabilize the system and prevent further damage. Little did they know, this was just the beginning of one of the most infamous incidents in telecom history. The hours following the initial collapse of AT&T's long-distance network were a frantic race against time, and engineers and technicians scrambled to identify and fix the root cause of the failure. As the cascading outages spread from switch to switch, the scale of the problem became clear. This was not a simple hardware malfunction or routine overload. This was a software failure on a scale never before seen in the telecom industry. To understand what had happened, it's essential to look at the heart of the AT&T's network, the 4ESS electronic switches. These massive machines, each capable of handling 700,000 calls per hour, formed the backbone of the system. They worked by receiving, processing, and then forwarding signals between local exchanges and long-distance carriers. But the real magic lay in the common channel signaling system number 7, which we called SS7. It's the control that allowed the switches to communicate with one another. SS7 was a revolutionary technology at the time, enabling switches to check the status of each other and intelligently route calls around congested or unavailable routes. Instead of relying on the actual voice lines, SS7 used a separate, dedicated signaling channel to send messages between the switches. This parallel system allowed the network to operate with incredible efficiency, handling millions of calls per day with minimal delay. But this efficiency came at a cost. The SS7 protocol was extremely complex, and any malfunction could ripple across the entire network. 
And that's precisely what happened on January 15th, 1990. The New York switch performed a routine self-check and found that it was nearing its load capacity. As a safeguard, that switch then initiated the brief reset, taking itself offline for a few seconds to recalibrate. Basically, it reboots itself. This was a standard procedure. Each switch was designed to handle these resets gracefully, notifying other switches of its status via SS7 and then returning to normal operations without issue. So perhaps it will come as no surprise that the problem lay in a software update that had been rolled out just weeks earlier. The update included an optimization meant to speed up the way that switches handled certain types of messages, particularly those involving status updates between switches. While the new code had been thoroughly tested, a subtle bug had slipped through, a single line of code buried deep in the logic that would set off a chain reaction of failures. The bug itself was deceptively simple, a misplaced break statement within a nested set of conditional clauses. The break was supposed to terminate a specific condition within the if block, allowing the program to continue processing messages. But instead, as per the C language, the break caused the software to prematurely exit the entire switch block, skipping critical steps in the message handling. Now, this error was particularly dangerous when handling closely timed messages, which SS7 generated frequently as part of its normal operation. So here's what happened. When the New York switch came back online after its reset, it sent out a message to all the other switches indicating that it was now ready to process calls again. This message was quickly followed by a second one, unintentionally sent just milliseconds after the first. Normally, the second message should be queued and processed later, but that faulty break statement called the receiving switch to overwrite its internal state for the message before it finished processing the first message. This caused the receiving switch to shut down because it probably noted the failure and then reset itself in an attempt to cover the perceived error. And of course, what does it do? It sends the same two messages to all the other switches. Now, this is a classic race condition bug where the timing of events matters a great deal. And for this rather insidious bug to manifest, the system had to receive two messages in quick succession so that the break statement caused the data from one message to overwrite the second. The reset of this second switch also triggered yet another message to the rest of the network, informing the other switches that it too was temporarily offline. But before it could fully reset, the second switch received its own duplicate message, repeating the same error. Within seconds, this process repeated across AT&T's entire network of all 114 switches, each one encountering the same bug, resetting itself and spreading the failure even further. What made this failure so catastrophic was the way in which SS7 amplified the problem. The signaling network, designed to reroute calls around unavailable switches, now became the very thing that spread the outage. Each time a switch reset, it flooded the network with messages that the other switches couldn't properly handle, causing them to reset as well. The bug had created an unstoppable loop of resets and failures with no way to halt the cascading shutdowns. At the root of the problem was the break statement in the software's message handling routine. Here's the specific pseudocode again that led to the disaster. When a switch received the second message while still processing the first, the faulty break caused the program to skip over crucial instructions, leading to memory overwrites and corrupted data. This flaw, though minuscule in the grand scheme of the network's operations, became a ticking time bomb. During periods of heavy traffic, like the holiday season, the switches were able to manage just fine because the likelihood of closely timed messages was reduced by the sheer volume of data flowing through the system. It was too busy for things to happen very quickly. But in the quieter moments of January 15th, when the network wasn't under heavy load, the precise timing of the messages allowed the bug to manifest in a way that triggered the cascading failures. By 11.30 p.m., after nearly nine hours of chaos, AT&T engineers managed to bring the network back under control by drastically reducing the messaging load and applying a software patch that bypassed the faulty logic. So the bug was fixed, but the damage had been done. Over 50 million phone calls had been lost and AT&T's reputation for reliability had been shaken. This technical flaw, one that had passed through rigorous testing and remained hidden for weeks, highlighted a profound vulnerability in complex systems. Even the smallest coding error, when placed in the right circumstances, can lead to catastrophic failures on a massive scale. As the night wore on and the AT&T engineers managed to stabilize the network, the broader ramifications of the 1990 collapse began to emerge. It wasn't just a technological failure. It was a devastating blow to AT&T's reputation. For a company that had built its brand on reliability and security, the outage was a public relations nightmare. Within the span of nine hours, the very foundation of the network, once considered nearly infallible, had been undermined by a single line of faulty code. AT&T immediately faced a wave of scrutiny from both the public and the industry. 
How could such a small software error bring down the largest long-distance phone network in the world? AT&T had invested heavily in its infrastructure, advertising its robust redundancy measures, fail-safes, and self-healing systems. In theory, no single switch should have been able to cause a cascading failure of this magnitude. And yet here it was. An entire network crippled by what seemed to be an insignificant oversight. The post-mortem investigations revealed that while the bug had been subtle, it was not undetectable. The software upgrade that included the erroneous break statement had passed through layers of testing, but none of the tests had exposed the defect. This incident shed a light on a fundamental weakness in the way that complex systems were being tested at the time. While the code may work perfectly under normal conditions, it's the edge cases, the closely timed messages during low network traffic, that reveal the most dangerous flaws. I'm most surprised that this code made it through code review. When you're altering a piece of code that performs a critical function, it would be customary to have a couple of senior devs, one that are intimately familiar with that bit of code, review the change. And the reality is that the logic here is very simple. This isn't rocket science code. It's something that any seasoned C programmer should have been able to spot, and something that should have been under close scrutiny before it was allowed to enter the production code. The immediate damage was obvious. AT&T lost an estimated $60 million in revenue from unconnected calls, a staggering amount by any standard, and it would be much higher today in today's dollars. But the real cost lay in the ripple effects that reached far beyond AT&T's network. Airline reservation systems, hotel chains, credit card verification services, and countless other businesses reliant on long-distance calling were suddenly paralyzed. Though these businesses weren't directly part of AT&T's infrastructure, the outage revealed just how deeply interconnected the nation's economic engine had become with its telecommunications networks. Keep in mind that in those days, there was no widespread access to anything like the internet, and long-distance calls were, for most people, the only way to reach folks that lived outside of your immediate area. Your other option was to write a letter. So being unable to reach anybody at all for half a day sounds a little spooky. For AT&T, the technical fix was relatively straightforward. A faulty code was patched, and the network slowly returned to normal operations. But the larger implications of the incident forced a reckoning within the telecommunications industry. The collapse underscored the dangers of over-reliance on automated systems. Systems that were assumed to be bulletproof, but had, in fact, introduced new vulnerabilities. One of the key lessons learned was the importance of fail-safes and redundancies that are not just theoretical, but are actually rigorously tested against a wide variety of conditions. AT&T had built its system to avoid single points of failure, but the network's self-healing mechanisms, which were designed to isolate and repair faulty switches, had actually contributed to the problem. Instead of containing the failure of the SS7 protocol, combined with the bug had spread it faster than the engineers could contain it. In the wake of the disaster, AT&T revamped its testing protocols, particularly for software upgrades. More attention was given to stress testing code under various load conditions, including the kind of low-traffic edge case scenarios that triggered the 1990 collapse. Other companies in the telecommunications sector also took note. The incident became a case study in the fragility of highly complex systems. Systems that, while theoretically robust, were still prone to unexpected failures due to the smallest of errors. While I couldn't find a reference to indicate what their policy was at the time, it's normal to rule out important software updates in a staged manner. Perhaps first you update 10% of the switches and see how it goes. The problem is that the bug in question didn't appear right away. It took a specific set of conditions to trigger it. And the odds are that as they rolled out the upgrade, even if they did it in a progressive and incremental fashion, the bug wasn't going to show itself until the worst possible time. The AT&T network collapse highlighted a growing concern in the tech industry. Software complexity. As systems became more intricate and interconnected, the potential for small errors to lead to massive failures increased. This event forced software engineers to reckon with the limitations of their tools and methods. The problem wasn't just at AT&T. It was an industry-wide challenge. The 1990 AT&T network collapse was a landmark moment in the history of telecommunications, not just for the chaos it caused, but for the lessons it taught. It exposed the vulnerabilities inherent in complex automated systems and forced the industry to re-examine its approach to software development and testing. Though AT&T eventually recovered, the collapse left an indelible mark on the future of network reliability and software engineering. In the end, the story of the 1990 collapse serves as a stark reminder of the delicate balance between innovation and reliability in a world increasingly dependent on technology. Please remember that I am mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. And if you're already subscribed, thank you. Make sure you turn on bell notifications. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. 
And check out our weekly podcast on the Dave's Attic channel where we answer the best viewer questions. The link is in the video description, so please give it a quick look if you've got a moment. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.